Who makes me laugh? Now, shall I tell you? It's Sarah Jessica Parker makes me laugh. I think Sex in the City is one of the funniest modern televisions going. And you know what's so lovely about it? Because they're taking really dicey subjects, but they do it with such class and such finesse. And um, I find myself howling with laughter with those. Whoopi Goldberg makes me laugh. Goldie Horn always makes me laugh. Jack Lemmon used to make me laugh. I loved his work. And Lucille Ball, of course. She was the sort of one who could, uh, when I was a kid, I used to watch her. And uh, on the early televisions over here, the black and white ones. Uh, so the few, a lot of the ones, a lot of the modern ones now, I don't like so much because they're crude. The scripts aren't so good. And you get bored with swearing. It seems the script is replaced by swear words, which is bad writing. And, and it's aggressive, a lot of it. But something like Sex and the City is fabulous. I think Vic Victoria Woolf is great. Um, I loved Jennifer Saunders and Joanna Lumley as a pair in Absolutely Fabulous. That was funny, really funny. I will never forget Patsy falling into the grave as she was walking along. That really made me laugh. Um, I like wit and I like the situation. I think most of the actors here are actors who can be comedic. People like Ronnie Barker, who's a brilliant actor and absolutely fabulous and funny. And I've worked with Ronnie in a radio show called Navy Lark. And we did the first Alan Akebourne play in the London. And I often wish that Ronnie had been a director as well because his ideas were just brilliant. And that was really good comedy. And who are the, all the other lovely ones? I used to like Abbott and Costello and Laurel and Hardy. I was never keen on Chaplin, but I liked Buster Keaton. I liked the subtlety things. And um, I once did a whole day I spent with George Cukor. And he came over here to direct a film and he was testing. And he was one of the greatest directors of comedy. And I remember him saying one of the big dangers for the British actors is that they like to nudge the audience and you should never nudge the audience. You should let them believe it. And it is the situation or the script that is funny. And that's what makes me laugh is a funny script or a very truthful performance that is just bizarre. And that makes me laugh. Lucille Ball, I admire because she was also very glamorous and yet hysterically funny and she could physically do things, really make you laugh. Um, she was seemed to be the same sort of background as a lot of us came from, which was vaudeville in American or musical as we knew it. And um, I mean, I started off studying to a lot of comedians, to people like Nat Mills, and I was doing Nat Mills and Bobby and I used to get shot out of a helicopter and fall through boxes while singing opera or playing a violin and then fall over something else. And so you were used to dancing and being able to make things appear funny. Scripts and ideas. I mean, I starred opposite Marty Feldman in his first film for British Lion. Now he was brilliant, brilliant scripts, but ideas and enthusiasm that could come from an idea or concept. So you have to have the talent to do that. And we, um, we would just take off. We would be given the situation, given the script, and then what we did with that, they just used to let the cameras roll and we would take off. And on that film, by the way, Penelope Keith came in as a part as an au pair called Lottie Somebody, as a big German with big black plastic stuff on. And <laughs> that was a very funny scene. But scripts, if you don't have a decent script, and you have lots of swear words, it's not funny. And some of it's getting very crude, very aggressive, and I think rather cruel. The great situation comedy keeping up appearances was successful because it had no swear words in it, lots of innuendo, and all the past, like um, Frankie Howard, Ronnie Barker, all those people, it was innuendo. The one lovely one who went to um, America, lots of them went to America, um, it was all innuendo, Benny Hill. Innuendo, but not in your face, 
crude, showing things. And I mean, at the moment, it's sort of like everybody wants to show a penis. It's just so awful. And, and you can get bored with seeing lots of penises on television. It's, it's, it's also very aggressive, and I don't like it. And most people, I don't know who the people are who choose it, because most of the people I speak to, a lot of my fans write say, oh, it's good to see all the repeats because um, we're fed up with the new stuff. So who on earth is putting it out? <laughs> I think Britain, um, they started this great thing, uh, this theory of we had to take everything out to the regions. So everything became regionalized. Well, it's fine, but they could still be clear about it. There's an awful lot of regions, I dare say, in America too, where actually I don't know what they're talking about because and, and what's that? It might be funny if you live in that area, but to the rest of the country, they don't know what the hell you're talking about. And um, the wonderful thing about the past was that it was standard, just like the Americans have a standard American. And um, now I think they've gone right over the top with regionalization and they need to come back again to something that applies to everybody. I remember when um, Harold Snow, of course, is the great director who I'd worked with before with Dick Emery. And um, when he was going to put a Keeping Up appearances together, he, he had a pilot scheme. They'd given him very little time. So he looked up Spotlight and looked through all the people he'd worked with who worked fast. And um, he sent me the script and I looked at it and he said, do you think there's anything you can do with Daisy? And I said, well, there's not much going for her really, is there? Um, but then I was thinking of the little character that I'd once done with Nat Mills, which was a very sort of simple soul, very childlike. And when I got together with the others and I went down to the wardrobe room and I found this really wonderful gray cardigan, which was awful. And I thought, that is my Daisy cardigan. And that's, it sort of put that on and you felt right. And I had some terrible old sandals, which I brought up and used. And um, slowly the relationships developed between the sisters. So we knew that um, Hyacinth was the bossy one and she'd kept us all down because she'd the one who, in English terms, she would have gone to the grammar school, we would have all gone to the secondary modern, and uh, if we sort of lost that long. And she was the one with the brains and aspirations. And um, so gradually we all sort of started working together and found the, Harold told us to make it north of Watford, and because uh, there were so many, there were Pats from Liverpool and so is Jeff, and uh, there were all these different accents. Clive Swift I'd worked with before um, in, a sort of heavier drama. But we all sort of headed up with the northern accent. Then I had to find <laughs> the sound, so I lifted it up and got it into a higher timbre than I normally use. This was very difficult when one year, I think it was 1993, I was doing Cemetery Club playing Ida, which is New York Bronx. And so I was using the lower register of my voice. But in the mornings, I was filming Daisy in, in, in Keeping Up Appearances, and to try and leap my voice up back up to Daisy's voice. And I remember there was take after take where I couldn't, couldn't hit the right sound. And uh, then I got it, and it was just one rubbishy take after another. Uh, the sound is very important. Mm. And also, once um, Harold gave me a Mills and Boone book, which is one of these romantic books, and because I believe so much in people reading books, um, I said, can I make this part of Daisy's thing? She hasn't got any romance going on. Can she please have a romantic book every week? And um, so that was part of the, my suggestion. And what was lovely, I, I was at a publishing dinner and the Mills and Boone people were there and they came bouncing up and they said, oh, our book sales have gone up. So I went to Harold and I said, can I read one of my own books in the bed instead of Mills and Boone? He said, you are not doing advertising at all. <laughs> but Harold was the great mover behind that series because if there was anything that didn't really work, he would rewrite. Our scenes were usually beautifully done, beautifully written, and Jeff and I used to learn them very quickly so that we didn't have to come in on Saturday mornings. And Clive, and uh, Joe and David used to get fed up because Pat used to like working Saturday mornings 
and we used to get through our stuff very quickly so we didn't have to come in. And Clive used to say, it's not fair, it's not fair, why can't they come in? And uh, we'd done our stuff, so we were ready to shoot on Sunday. What one woman finds attractive, another woman would say, yeah. And um, so I think it's lovely that Daisy absolutely worshipped Onslow, and I think she genuinely did. She used to try and make him jealous. A lot of the time it was very difficult not to giggle. I remember at that terrible time on the motorbike where I had to strut up and down in this black leather and Clive and Geoffrey were standing together and they were tr going practically cross-eyed because they didn't want to laugh. And um, the other one was doing that strip tease thing, the bumps and grinds. Well, there I was very glad from all one's vaudeville days. So, but <laughs> him trying to keep a straight face was quite difficult. I know on the first, first um, day of the pilot, um, with the live audience in, <laughs> we came on to do our scene, climbed into the bed, and the whole bed collapsed. And our legs were in the air, and this audience, they were just running around. And this sort of thing happened regularly. It wasn't just once the bed collapsed, but several times. Also, he was very naughty. He used to pinch my bum underneath the covers and say rude things. And he would say it just before I had a line to say. And then I'd get the giggles, and they'd all think, what's the matter with her? Uh, I used to get my own back. I used to get my own back when he couldn't say a word. And then I'd smile at him. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll never forget once when he was lighting a cigarette and trying to be all casual about and he got it stuck to his lip. <laughs> and his lip went up like that. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun on it, a lot of naughtiness. <laughs>